Our next two speakers are our two most distinguished speakers on the panel, Dr. Serena Mateen, who is a professor of urology at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, who's been a pioneer and innovator and leader in the treatment of upper urinary tract disease. And then Dr. Seth Lerner, who's one of the true leaders of uh, bladder cancer and neurologic oncology involved in multiple uh, 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 committees uh, nationally and internationally. So this is actually a very exciting time for us who treat this disease uh, because up until two years ago there really was nothing happening. Uh, but starting in 2015 uh, we had our first ever national cooperative group trial uh, open um, and this actually is a non-randomized study uh, looking at the benefit of chemotherapy before removal of the kidney and ureter. Uh, this study is designed to look at patients who have both good as well as not so good kidney function so it's two arms based on the status of the kidney function and uh, what's very gratifying is that uh, despite initial concerns that maybe we, we could not enroll uh, enough patients from this uncommon disease, we actually were able to fully enroll in one of the arms uh, within a couple of years. Um, the second arm, uh, which was for patients with more compromised kidney function, is still open to enrollment. Uh, but I do anticipate that to also uh, complete maybe in the next year, and hopefully we should have a readout on the results of this um, within a year or two. Uh, and this uh, should help um, uh, confirm what we have seen on prior retrospective uh, studies. Now this particular uh, protocol uh, or clinical trial is for patients who have high risk disease. And so patients who we worry that surgery may not be enough to bring a good chance of cure. Uh, and so these are patients with high-grade tumors. And the advantage, particularly, of giving the chemotherapy first is because that's when patients have the best renal function. Once we remove the kidney and the ureter, the kidney function dramatically decreases. Uh, we have several studies that show that up to 80% of patients who have surgery are really unable uh, to receive effective chemotherapy after surgery. So really, the, the best time to do it, we think, is before surgery is done, when uh, the best kidney function is present. So within a year after that, another very exciting thing happened, which is that a company developing a new drug was interested in treating the disease. Uh, this is actually quite a milestone also, because up until this time, uh, such a thing had never happened. Uh, what's interesting about this is that it's not really a drug, but a drug-device combination. Uh, the drug is mitomycin C, uh, a chemotherapy. Actually, it was initially developed as an antibiotic, initially discovered in 1963. It turned out to be fairly toxic as an antibiotic, but was pretty effective because of toxicity to uh, treat cancers. And we have actually used this for urothelial cancer and uh, dripping it in the bladder, or in some cases in the upper tract, uh, to try to prevent recurrence of disease. The device is really what's unique. It's not so much a device as you might think like a tool, uh, but it's really uh, a gel. And it's, uh, this gel has a unique property in that it does the opposite of what you might think most gels do, like Jell-O, uh, because it's liquid when it's cold and then it becomes uh, thicker when it comes up to body temperature. And then subsequently, it dissolves slowly in uh, other liquids, such as urine. So this product, the combination of the mitomycin with the hydrogel, is called mitogel. Uh, what this graph shows you is basically the fact that when it's cold, it has the consistency of about motor oil. But then as the temperature goes up, it quickly becomes more viscous and thick and turns into this gel that can sit in a cavity and then slowly be dissolved. So the idea here is that uh, somebody can uh, receive the mitogel as an outpatient within the renal pelvis and the ureter. And what this would allow uh, to happen is that higher doses of the chemotherapy and a longer uh, uh, exposure of that internal urinary system to the chemotherapy, possibly improving its ability 
to eradicate and as well prevent uh, uh, urothelial cancers. So it treats the internal urinary system from all the way in that renal pelvis down the ureter and even the bladder. And then the patient, of course, urinates to get rid of uh, this as, as urine is being produced. We don't think it's going to be absorbed by the body. It's uh, topical therapy, basically. It's as if uh, putting uh, cream on your skin, except if you think about it as an inside-out skin. This neat, neat little video uh, kind of gives you a visual of uh, what happens, where, again, as an outpatient, <clears throat> Uh, the patient uh, has a cystoscopy done. We pass that tube up into the ureter and into the renal pelvis. And then under x-rays, uh, we can um, uh, visualize the gel going in. This just uh, basically showing some of the things that we've talked about, about removal of the kidney and ureter being a standard. This is what the gel looks like. Uh, it's liquid when it's cold with all the ice cubes around it. And then as was shown previously, uh, we inject it up into the renal pelvis. And as we do so, it uh, basically if it goes into all the little crevices within the renal pelvis. It gels. And then as urine is being produced, it uh, helps dissolve the uh, gel as well as the chemotherapy. Um, and uh, basically allows it to contact the tumors and to slowly eradicate them. And this happens over the course of four to six hours, depending on how much you give. And uh, uh, as mentioned, this is currently uh, some, it's something that is, we're using under uh, a clinical trial. And so as opposed to that initial trial that I showed you, which was for high-grade tumors and high-risk tumors, this is really for low-risk tumors. Now, it doesn't mean that they're um, of, of any lower priority for us. It does mean that they're low likelihood to metastasize, but they are a major burden for the patient. They tend to recur. They're difficult to treat for uh, reasons that were previously explained by the other speakers. Um, and so <clears throat> currently for this clinical trial, this is indicated for low-grade small tumors up to 1.5 centimeters. You could have multiple tumors being present. It's just none of them can be larger than 1.5 centimeters. Um, it is open label, uh, meaning you would know what you're getting. And it's single arm, meaning that patients who enroll for sure will uh, get the drug if they are eligible. And then this little schematic shows uh, what happens. In the first one to three weeks, we perform screening to make sure that it's safe for the patient and they're eligible. And then the treatment is given once a week for six weeks similar to what we do for treating uh, bladder cancer with topical therapy. We then give three weeks of rest, and then we evaluate the patient with repeat ureteroscopy to see if there has been complete eradication of the tumors or not. If there has been, that's considered successful, and then the patient can actually get monthly maintenance therapies. And if not, then um, if they don't receive maintenance, then we just continue doing follow-up. Now, this is a trial that is being monitored by the FDA and was approved by the FDA. So really, a, a, it, it would be, again, another major milestone for this disease. First of all, because it would be the first drug ever approved for this particular disease. But secondly, because it has the potential to completely change how we treat low-grade upper tract urothelial cancer. You know, currently, we have to do multiple endoscopies we often have to take out kidneys and ureters because of the recurrent pattern of, this, uh, of these tumors. And so we do hope uh, that it will be an improvement over our current therapies. And what's exciting is that this study, while it is enrolling really well nationally and internationally, it is probably going to be open still for another six or nine months. Um, we anticipate uh, about that period of time based on the current rate of enrollment. And a lot of the speakers that are actually uh, on this panel are also uh, directly uh, involved at their centers uh, for anybody who may be interested uh, out there who's listening. Now, there are some uh, other treatments and uh, promising paradigms on the horizon. Uh, there is a, a stent being developed with the same similar idea where a chemotherapy could be loaded into it. The stent is then placed, and then the chemotherapy slowly dissolves out. Uh, treating the urinary tract over a longer period.
period of time than we can currently do. This is still in the very early prototype stages, however. Um, the other thing that's very exciting that's happening in patients who have incurable disease is this new generation of immunotherapy drugs that are called generally uh, checkpoint blockade. This is really changing the whole landscape of how incurable urothelial cancer is being treated. And what's interesting about upper tract cancer also is that there's a high rate of mutations and unstable genes, and this we think is a factor that may make them more susceptible to immunotherapy. So while these new immunotherapies are not approved for treating patients with, for example, low-grade disease or localized disease, um, there is the idea that over time these treatments will, will trickle down to these lower stages um, as long as they could be uh, well tolerated in this uh, patient population. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Also, you know, one of the things about those tumors that have many mutations, uh, especially in the uh, Lynch syndrome and, and microsatellite instability and so forth, they're looking at a whole a new generation of drugs called the PARP inhibitors. Can you comment a little bit on that while, while I have you on the phone? Um, I can speak only a little bit about it. I'm, I'm also still, um, uh, you know, familiarizing myself with that. But some of the genetic studies that we have done on upper tract cancer, uh, which also goes along with what we see in bladder cancer to some degree, is that there are these uh, situations of patients who have no tobacco exposure, uh, no industrial exposure, a lot of women actually who are never smokers. And what we notice when we do their genetic analyses is that they um, some of the mutations are related to DNA repair genes, basically a malfunction in the ability of the body to repair uh, uh, problems in their DNA, something that otherwise every other cell in our body should be able to do. And so the idea with the PARP inhibitors is that it could help reverse that to some degree. And so I do think that's probably still some point, some time away, Gary, but maybe you can uh, comment a little bit in terms of what could be coming out. Absolutely, and, and 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 I think that we're seeing uh, PARP inhibitors uh, in a variety of tumors, uh, especially the ones where we see a high mutational load in, in, in these uh, uh, in the colon cancer realm with the microsatellite instability, as well as in the ovarian cancers, breast cancers. So I think that that it's a whole new avenue of treatment, uh, and again, I think it's related to the fact that we've done the genomic analyses in. Uh, uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer, mainly through the, the Cancer Genome Atlas project, but also a lot of individual investigators, such as at, at your institution at MD Anderson and so forth, uh, and Baylor and, and, and Sloan Kettering and Hopkins and so forth, that have, that have done these studies that uh, are helping patients uh, and helping us to personalize uh, their therapy to uh, uh, make make uh, make major inroads in, in, in curing a lot of patients with these uh, devastating diseases.